for reasons very much beyond my control and having absolutely nothing to do with the content, I have been having the very devil of a time trying to record this video. In fact, it has been so many attempts and so many iterations of this video that I'm beginning to not want to record this video. <laughs> but I think it's kind of necessary. What is this video, you may ask? This is, for now, my impressions of Circle of Hands. When I initially conceived of this video, I thought I would put it both at the fore and at the end of the playlist. So, you know, if you're first coming to it, you'd, you'd look at it like an overview. But now, especially after having said most of it so many times, I see it, it's more appropriate as a, as a capstone. This is something that you come to at the end of the playlist. So these are my currently final thoughts on Circle of Hands. What makes them only currently final is that I'm, I need to have a playtest. I've reached the end of what I can do with the text just as a reader or just analyzing it. I can't really say anything more intelligent about it until I've had a chance to to play the game and interact with players about the game. And I intend to do that. Also, another thing that we intend to do is to try and match up my schedule with the author's schedule, Ron Edwards, and have an interview focused on the game and see what that turns up. So I think uh, those two experiences will definitely have an impact on my final impressions. So take these impressions with a grain of salt. They come only from reading the text, living with it for a couple of months now, doing you know minor play tests uh, on my own when I've had the chance. And, uh, and that is all. So... Rather than have this continue on being a video about itself, let's get to the content. I think the most important question that I should start off with is, do I want to play this game? And the answer, quite honestly, has flipped back and forth between yes and no, both before I started trying to record this video two weeks ago, and... And right now, there are versions of this video or you know, fragments of this video where I, my intention was to say, no, I don't want to play this game, and here's why. And there are many more versions where I say, yeah, this is where I want to play the game, and, and here's why. Um, ultimately, and in a way, I'm thankful that it's been so hard to get this video filmed. Ultimately, it, came, it comes down to I'm not really sure who I would play it with. So yes, I want to play the game. Yes, I want to use the system. Yes, I want to explore this. Yes, I want to sit down and, and go through just rules as written and follow that experience out and see how it really deviates from my own personal practices, that kind of thing. I'm ready to go. I would do that right now. But with whom? And that's really been the stickler. And there are a couple of levels to that. But mostly it's about the sort of stories which would emerge in play. Um, not everybody that I play with now, I feel, is interested in exploring darker stories. You know, my face-to-face my -face game group plays Star Wars. And although Star Wars is a very broad palette that goes from, you know, the, the heights of swashbuckling to the, the very depths of suicidal despair, you can tell as our campaign makes those shifts when people are, are pulling away from the game and when they're engaging with it. And so using my full, you know, face-to-face -face gaming group doesn't seem likely with this game. So who? People I would meet online, I guess, and that would entail 
an interview to make sure that we're not wasting each other's time. Because one thing I found about games run through Hangouts is that they're very hard for me to schedule. They occur at awkward times for the people I really want to game with. And we have these narrow windows. And to use what I consider to be precious time on a game that the other person might not like is not how I want to spend my time. Why wouldn't they like it? Well, I can't speak for them, and that's that's actually the hard part uh, and why I've been struggling with this aspect is because, you know, the game group I had 20 years ago, those people were long-term friends. They're still friends now. We knew each other really well. We were much better equipped to say to each other, you're really going to like this. I don't really have that kind of relationship with the people I usually game with now. Right? And I'm still gaming with those people from 20 years ago, but it's in play by email, which is not the same sort of thing at all. Our schedules do not align for play on Hangouts. So it's that which is giving me pause. Other than that, why might someone hesitate with this game? I may have said this before in an earlier clip. I've recorded this, or I've attempted to record this clip so many times it's getting hard to tell, but Circle of Hands is a game which puts a lot of trust, has a lot of faith in you to play it. It doesn't provide you with prepared adventures. It doesn't even want you to prepare adventures, to prepare stories, to create scenes, to have set pieces, to assess threats. It's not that kind of game. It's a game of exploring as it happens. And I've had a lot of conversations on the internet through my blog and through my vlog about that concept. And I don't think that every conversation I think I've had about it has actually been about it. There, There's some evidence that comes back that that the idea of story is so deeply rooted within us that the idea of sitting down to play, having elements in your hand, but not planning in any way how to use them to create story from the Game Master's perspective is quite, is quite alien, right? That, that that is not something that, that you would do. And yet it is. And this game is written from the point of view of running the game that way. And this game, finally, I, I can't think of, of any other game, at least not off the top of my head, that does it this way, that sits down step by step, procedurally, and walks you through running a gritty, decision-based, right, morally-oriented fantasy combative game from that approach that's willing to take you through step by step very clearly so that you can step away from the idea of modules, prepared encounters, uh, you know, threat ratings and, and encounter balance and all of the stuff. Step away from it. Step away from prepared story and toward emergent story. And I found reading through it very reaffirming. You know, one of those experiences, like when you hear a song from from your favorite band that's that's talking about things that are important to you, right? Reading through this game was kind of like, yes, you know, there are other people out there who want to play like I do, who do play like I do. And not only is it the author who, you know, might just be penning this work in total isolation, there's feedback in the book from people who play this way. You know, so although this is a very poorly represented area of the hobby, this game has it in spades. I like that. I like that. You, the listener, may not or may not know that you do yet. You may not have had the chance to experience it. So 
For some, that would be a reason to stay away, rightly or wrongly. The other thing is that it's a serious game. It takes itself seriously. It takes you seriously. And the way that it's prepared, it's very easy to run a game where decisions matter, where consequences hurt, where violence is close to murder. It's a combat system where somebody is going to get hurt. It's a combat system that's gritty enough, that's painful enough, that if you embrace the idea of envisioning it, you'll want to find other routes than this to solve your problems. And if you're pushed by a situation, by another character, to wanting to commit an act of violence, you are accepting the fact that you want to kill them. It's not euphemistic combat. It's killing. I like that. Not everybody will. Not everybody will want to get into that kind of gritty game. And so, for all of those reasons, I'm not sure, at this particular moment, who I would play it with. But, to turn that on its head, if I were sure, I would want to play it right now. Like, right now. I'd want to get going. I want to try out my characters. I want to take the characters that other people have played and get my chance to run them. I want to see what disturbing things bubble up between the cracks, between the other players and myself, between what is stated and what is implied, between what those characterizations allow us to experience and to say. For me, Circle of Hands is exciting because of that. And there's more. Other than the game, at the end of the game, we have these two chapters. And one of them shows us the original version, like the recovered document of the game. And I'm not going to focus too much on that in this clip, but it's it's very cool to be able to look at different editions of a game. If you're looking behind me here, you're going to see all the editions of Ars Magica, for example. And if you can see more of the shelves, you're going to see three different editions of Blue Planet. All the editions of Shadowrun are right there above my head somewhere. So, this is something that I really like, being able to look at how it started, how it changed, how it evolved. It becomes mostly relevant to me, though, after I've had a chance to play the game. So, But the other chapter is on the concept of redemption, and particularly the concept of redeeming a fantasy heartbreaker. If you're unfamiliar with the term fantasy heartbreaker, it gets thrown around a lot now. It's an old term. And uh, I find it's mostly used now as a pejorative. It's just right, somebody's homebrew. It's just a collection of homemade rules. It's just some guy from some basement somewhere's game. You know, fantasy Heartbreaker gets applied in that way, I feel. The essay on it, the essays on it, show us something different. That the heartbreak isn't so much that it's just a something but that there was something. There was an element to the game which was brilliant. But not polished. Or was polished, but nobody ever saw this game. You know. <laughs> there are a lot of people with a lot of groups who have spent a lot of time honing their craft as players, as game masters, and who have spent that same time building games that they never showed to anybody else, or covered up with what they thought were expected. Hiding the real nature of their game. What Edwards is doing now and encouraging in this chapter of the book 
is the redemption, right? The, the, the rediscovery, the exploration of those brilliant mechanics of, of that passion, of those ideas, and sharing them. Who's to say what could become the next big revolution? Who's to say? It could be something so simple, so elegant. No one had ever thought of it before, and it would be a shame not to share it. More than that, denying yourself the opportunity to take your years of experience, your hard-won knowledge and insight, the contributions of your playgroup and all the people that you've crossed paths with, and not taking the opportunity to take games apart, put other games together from their bones and try your hand at innovating. Not doing that is to deny yourself further insight into the games you love. Not everybody wants to design a game, but that doesn't have to be the end goal. I think most of us want to play the games that we love better. And the kind of insight that you can get from trying to work out a mechanic or trying to refine a mechanic you're having difficulty with or developing a house rule that everybody at the table is satisfied with that fixes some small little problem about a game that you love. This is all worthwhile. And then when it works, being willing to be open about it, to share it, to take your found document from however many years ago off the hard drive and say, you know, look, when I was a teenager or when I was in my 20s or when I was enduring heartbreak or whatever, I made this thing and I think parts of it are really good. I think all of Circle of Hands is really good. I want to find people to share it with and so I'm looking. If you're interested and you've gone through and learned the game, let me know. Let's see if we can you know, fight fate in time zones and, and make something happen. My impression of Circle of Hands is that this is a game that does what it promises. It does what it promises on the outside. The first impression you get when you look at that front cover, the game can deliver on that. The mental imagery you get as you read about the characters and their situation, the backdrop of their struggles, the game system can deliver that. And its promise of, of grit, its hint of promise of a realism that you will enjoy, its ability to make consequences striking, to make Combat, significant, not merely entertainment. It hits on all of these things. It's a game that does what it says it's going to do. It does so in a low page count. It does so in clear, easy-to-understand text. There is a forum supporting it in those areas where there could be multiple interpretations or where people want to push the game in, let's say, new directions. So, these are my current impressions of Circle of Hands. Positive. I like the game. I want to try the game. I think this is a game for me. I'm not sure this is a game for all of you but I would like you to read it and I would like you to try it. There's a couple of games I've encountered in my past where this is not true. All right. So, thank you. If you've made it all the way through all the videos in this playlist, you are a true road warrior and have great endurance. The game is interesting. I'm not sure that uh, if you haven't read it yourself, that these videos will make a lot of sense. So, read the game.